This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Linda Lattimore about corporate social responsibility programs to make a sustainable social impact. Linda Latimer, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. I am very happy to be here. It's a topic I love to talk about. Yeah, uh, so um, so it's so wonderful to have the chance to talk with you. You have such a uh, distinctive background and um, really, I look forward to the discussion today. Linda Latimer is a seasoned lawyer, a corporate executive and business strategist. Linda has worked as the lead counsel for various multinational corporations and as the chief of the fraud section of the U.S. Attorney's Office, Southern District of Texas, where she first chaired many noteworthy trials. Her international corporate and litigation background have given her the tools to provide astute guidance and counsel in today's changing and highly regulated climate. An American who lived for many years in Peru and Mexico, Linda is fluent in Spanish, conversant in French and has traveled extensively throughout the world with her work. Linda is a well-regarded speaker who believes that social responsibility is critical to competitive edge. She often consults on this new norm of business, encouraging clients to create thriving social responsibility programs, which have a direct impact on their bottom line. She's the founder of Cross Sector Institute, which includes cross sector law and educational platform, by and for socially responsible attorneys, Cross Sector Gives, a community give back program and Cross Sector Advantage, which offers small companies a toolkit to set up their own programs, allowing them to compete in a world where socially responsible, uh, where social responsibility requisites have become the norm. So again, uh, what a fascinating background. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you uh, so much. Thank and is you. there any, anything else you'd like to add before we kind of jump on into the topic for today? Well, I mean, maybe the only other thing that I would, would add in there is that although I have a really heavy corporate background, obviously, with all those years, I do a tremendous amount of work with individuals. I released a book two years ago called Solutionaries, You're the Answer, that ended up number one on Amazon first day out, giving individuals uh, a path to figure out how they can do I'm going to say fill their heart accounts as full as their bank accounts because people were really coming to me trying to find work that they woke up excited to each day. And I think that that is connected to giving back in terms of social impact. That's my personal belief. That's the way you tie your heart in too. So I have been doing a tremendous amount of work with individuals as well as corporations on that path. Wonderful. And getting connected on this topic is so important. Uh, it, it I believe social impact initiatives are kind of the blue ocean out there for organizations as they're thinking about meaningful work and purpose and, um, you know, a purpose, a purpose driven career and employee engagement. Um, We, we, we talk a lot about employee engagement and having a positive organizational culture um, generally. And, and there's all these different tactics and and approaches to trying to accomplish that. Um, but more and more employer employees are wanting more meaningful connection and to give back to the world. They want to do that, not just in their free time, but through their work. 
Uh, and I think more and more organizations are starting to recognize and realize that as potential um, to, to strengthen their employee um, value proposition, to, to uh, better attract and retain uh, top employees, and to strengthen their bottom line while simultaneously giving back to the community. Um, so great, great uh, background and really interesting um, uh, expertise that you bring to the table for this discussion today. Mm -hmm. um, to start things off, I was wondering if you, if you wouldn't mind just sharing your kind of conception and framing of social impact work. Um, and yeah, let's start there. Yeah. Ab absolutely, and and let me tell you, it's it's a uh, I'm kind of a little bit on a bandwagon about this, or on a pulpit about this, because it's a it's a conversation I've been having with folks a long time before COVID, which is bringing up a whole new set of questions about what that means, right, in terms of serving humanity right now. Um, you know, we used to call these programs corporate social responsibility, and you don't even see those words tied. We're not using those words that much because people kept getting stuck on the word social. They would think of the word social like socialism or social services, and they would immediately go where the corporation was concerned or the business was concerned to charity work. And that is not what these programs are about. It is a component of it, but it's not what the programs are about. So, you know, I've written blogs on this and done talks on this. And what I've said is, come on, guys, the word social just means people. I mean, we could have a colony of ants somewhere and they would be social too. But for our purposes, we're talking about people. So when we put those in context, then we say we have a corporate, could be business, doesn't have to actually be a legal corporation. We have corporate, social, it means it's about people. Now that could be your employees, your customers, the community around you or your vendors and responsibility, why you're accountable to these human beings as a business. And then they go, oh, I kind of understand now what CSR means, and I've taken out the charity piece, right? Because it just used to be that if a company was socially responsible, it was writing a check to some kind of partnership with Goodwill or Junior Achievement, they really weren't using it in terms of how well am I treating my employees, and do I have fair play with my vendors, and do I actually know what my customers want or am I telling them what they want? And oh, by the way, there is the community piece which equals our planet too out there, right? So now I think this is finally bubbling up now with this, um, this pandemic that we're sitting in the middle of because companies are starting to shift to serve humanity in a different way. And I find it a really, really interesting time right now to see how that's gonna play out. I think the companies that are doing that are gonna be the ones that succeed and roll out of this with a stronger face than the ones that are gonna try and go back to the old ways. Yeah, that's, I, I agree. Um, I, I think the pandemic just heightens the, and it brings it greater attention to the need um, for being in the social good, um, you know, as companies go about doing their business. Um, I kind of, my, my kids and I were joking the other day because we were watching a show on Hulu or something and they had these ads come up and every single ad, every single ad um, that came on was a company trying to frame themselves that way. Um, regardless of how much they're actually do yeah, regardless of how much they're actually doing, um, they're, tr they, they're trying to frame it that way because they know how distasteful it is right now to be, um, actively promoting their brand in their traditional ways. And so they're going about it through this tact, you know, whether that's going to be effective or not, I guess we'll see. But, um, but organizations are at least understanding um, that aspect of it. But now it's important to pull them in to understanding, you know, more holistically, more fully the types of initiatives that they can, they can foster and they can champion within their organizations yes. to make real meaningful, sustainable impact in our communities, um, not just using the right language and the buzzwords and all of Well, that. because honestly, for me, and I, I, I did a Facebook Live the other day because I was getting a little bit worried about what I was seeing, which was every Tom, Dick, and Mary was jumping up to say they were the leaders and they were going to guide us through this mess for free and do all, you see, you're seeing all the stuff bubble up to tuck on your heartstrings, think they're the good guys, when the truth of the matter is 
they may not have those programs inside their own business that they're just trying to tug on the heartstrings right now. And it reminds me very much of what we used to see called cause marketing. And, you know, people woke up to cause marketing years ago, when, you know, when we were all sticking the, not all, but I mean, the stores would have the little tags on your clothes that said 20% being donated to the rainforest. At first we thought that was so cool, but no one ever bothered to go look and see if they really were giving it to the rainforest. And furthermore, what were the metrics and the impact that showed up even if they, we had no idea, but it, it tugged at our heartstrings. And then we'd go into the hotel chain and it would say, please, you know, if you use your dirty towels again, you're gonna save water on the planet. But they could have been treating their employees like crud. I mean, that's just the truth. And so I, I am a little worried right now that some of the companies that are showing up saying, look what good guys we are, is really regurgitating that old cause marketing thing and they aren't really doing it themselves. There are some that are, that are. I look at Dyson vacuum cleaners who immediately shifted their supply chain and their, and their manufacturing process over to ventilators. Obviously they needed to stay in business. People weren't buying as many vacuum cleaners. But it's a family-owned business, and they weren't out there promoting that. People got wind of it, and yes, I will buy a Dyson vacuum cleaner the next time I need to because I want to. You know, um, uh, one of the letters I got from the president—not me personally, but I received it out of the other million people from um, United Airlines—was very different than the letters I was receiving from Southwest and Delta and some of the other airlines, which were all about cleaning and sitting six feet apart and all that. His said, look, guys, we're repurposing, he didn't even mention that. We are repurposing our planes right now to get equipment, you know, up to essential workers and medical supplies because we're in a community together. I remember that letter much more than the other ones right now. Um, so we want our businesses to show up with this higher purpose, but they have to do it in an authentic way and they have to be walking the talk or it just doesn't count. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. What in your experience, and you're working with organizations that are doing this, um, what, what could a leader, say, Joe Blow business wherever, um, locally or whether it's national or international, what, what can they do right now to really get their foot in the door and start along this social mm -hmm. impact thinking and, uh, and creating initiatives within their organizations? You know, for me, it always gets back to the word social. And obviously the thing that is really um, of concern right now to everybody is how many people are losing their jobs. I mean, companies sadly do come and go. What was it? Pier One is now closing all their stores as of a few days ago. I mean, um, this just happens. That's just business, you know? But how do we treat our employees and the people that have been with us in a way that's honorable, helping them move on to the next opportunity? Can we give them the tools to, you know, exit in a way where they're going to succeed? And I, that's what I'm looking for when I'm talking to these companies. Like, what, what are you doing to assist this human being on their next step? Maybe you can't pay them right now, but can you give them you know, can you give them some training? Can you, is there anything that you can do? Can you pull in your network and help them find other stuff? Um, that is the social impact piece that affects employees right now. And, and for me, that's first and foremost, is, is, this, is the human piece that I feel we need to address right now. Yeah, understanding the human component um, is so key. And I'm a big proponent of a human-centered, employee-centered um, workplace. And regardless of whether you're connecting to socially responsible practices or social impact initiatives or not, you know, having an employee-centric uh, culture and, and workplace and environment is so critical anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking now within the pandemic response, you know, one of the best things organizations can do is just to be open, transparent, communicating authentically with their employees, showing support, um, and those sorts of elements just to help everyone feel a little bit of security um, and, and to help them deal, to, to help employees feel seen as people dealing with 
you know, struggles, you know, uh, a given employee, they might have their job, but their spouse might not have their job. Um, they're dealing with juggling work at home with raising their kids and schooling and all these different things. There's all these heightened anxieties and stressors um, that are influencing the nature of work for employees right now. So employers and leaders can help address that. And, and, and in, a, in essence, that is being socially responsible um, given this, this pandemic climate. Well, and I've got to be honest with you, what concerns me almost more than the employees right now are the contractors, because what I'm hearing from different clients is the, the first cut is going to be the contractors, not the employees, right? So all these small businesses that are really a key component of your supply chain for, and your service chain might be small businesses that are contractors. And I think there's ways to hang on to that relationship because when we circle back around and whatever it's going to be, let's say six months, if you've just cut the contractor loose and you don't really care, you, it, they're just a number to you, that human, it's still a human being and that human being is going to remember how that happened. No matter how hungry they are, they're going to remember you know, one example for me is my, my sister is a PhD English professor at a university, and she also works as a, a contract professor for a smaller university. So she's tenured at a bigger one and works, teaches some classes. And she is so grateful to the smaller one that even as a contractor in that position, they ran her through all the same training that they ran their regular employees on how to use Zoom, how to do contracts. And they give them, whereas the bigger university didn't even, didn't, even though she was employed there, didn't give them that amount of training. But the smaller one treated her very much as part of the, of the family, regardless of how she was compensated. And so that builds that loyalty factor because when these things are over, that social piece is not just your employees, it's your vendors, it's your customers, it's, it's your whole circle of influence. And so what exactly are you doing with your contractors as well? Are you, you know, they're not, they may not just come back to you when you need them. Right. So um, it's, it's a, it's a human touch point really at every level, at every level of the word social within your business radius. Yeah, and I, I've seen similar things. Um, interesting, you talking about the uh, the professor kind of situation. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the dual role um, uh, scholar practitioner. I, I have my uh, my role as a professor at the university, uh, but also do the consulting work. And I've seen the exact same types of things. Mm -hmm. In some cases, some positive things, and in other cases, some pretty negative. Um, ways that organizations that universities have, have dealt with their employees both uh, faculty staff um, but also contingent employees and, and the the, right. uh, the adjunct faculty so I think it, it's just really important that we we remember the human element in all of this just regardless of all the challenges um, maybe the last thing I'll, I'll ask you about you mentioned it a little bit earlier um, but the the importance of having um, impact metrics um, and how, how do you assess the impact that you're trying to have? Um, are, are there a couple things that you would recommend to organizations as they're trying to create a social impact strategy and the types of metrics that would go along with that? Yeah, I mean, you know, my attitude about this is if you can't measure it, don't waste your time or money on it. So, and it can be measured in a lot of different ways. I remember years ago, um, I was working with a, a large, large company that um, had a lot of engineers on staff. And they were trying to create all these cool social programs. They had different teams that were creating, and they were doing bake sales over here, and they were doing something else over here. And, they were, and I was like, oh, my God, they're all over the map. Uh, and finally, someone said, oh, I think I know what you're talking about. You know, our engineers go out to the um, junior high, and they help the science class with all their science projects. And I went, well, that is a typical signature partnership that we can then promote as, your, as a brand partnership, um, kind of like 
Uh, Avon works with the Komen Foundation, Target is back to school. I mean, I really like to, to suggest to, to clients, you know, don't go quail shooting here. <laughs> you know, you can tell I live in Austin. You, you, you want to have a partnership where if it, if it is a, a nonprofit partnership, for example, you want to know that you're getting as much from that nonprofit as they are from you, that you're not the one that's just always showing up, giving them money, giving them volunteers, but that they also have on their website what a great partner you are and point people your way. And that whatever work they're doing, you want to be able to see their impact with those dollars. If you give them $100, what did they use with that $100? Did it go to some kind of operational account? Uh, did actually get down to the final beneficiary or constituent that they were working with? Like, you want to be able to go back and tell your customers, you're buying from me. And if, for example, you do have one of these programs and they're donating, you're putting 10% towards this nonprofit, you can say, look, guys, look exactly what you did with your dollars. Here's exactly what. So that creates a very loyal brand ambassador with, with the customer. If it's green programs in your supply chain, I mean, you're going to dig in with all your, if you're in a manufacturing company, you're going to want to find out pretty quick, okay, if I cut here and I add here and I really, you know, slim things out and lean things out, what is the impact? For me personally, I think the, pro the issue, it's not a problem at all, but the issue sometimes that stops people from getting into these programs is that it's a long game. It's not, you're not going to see necessarily the results this quarter. You know, if you're trying to have great employee programs and that's going to help you with your recruiting and retention process, probably you're not going to see that reduction in the churn rate where those employees are concerned for, for you know, six months to nine months to a year, depending on how many people that you hire, right? If you have a large pool or short. So you've got to be able to say, here's my benchmark in terms of we don't have any of these programs today to show that we care with our employees. Okay, let's look at it now in nine months. Did I save money? Did it, did it really drop to the bottom line because I'm not doing so much training and recruiting? Winning? Okay, well, now we know that program works. Same with, with the green stuff. Okay, if I put in, like, this is also random and tiny, but if I put in insulation, for example, I'm probably not going to see unless I say what I'm paying in electricity today versus six months out. What did I save? So, you know, every single one before you start it, you have to say, well, how am I going to measure it? Here's the benchmark today. And what is going to be the measurement in six months or one year's time if I implement these programs? And if we can't plan on that, it's no different than a business strategy. Like, how am I going to make money? Your social impact strategy takes some forecasting right and then how am I going to do that and you don't want to do anything in terms of a social impact strategy that doesn't support your business strategy which was my argument with the engineers and the science project please quit the bake sales over here and do something where you look good as a company it comes in as a really cool brand thing even at the university and you can show that so it's just it it's strategy right yeah 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 and and I think it's so important to connect, um, to connect the assessment to the objectives of the program or initiative that connects back to the broader corporate strategy, all like you just mentioned. And a lot of organizations, well, a lot of organizations aren't doing anything in the social impact space. And most that are, are most, you know, they're mostly doing more employee volunteering types of programs um, or some sort of uh, branding types of, of, of PR related work, um, which are also good, but maybe they're not doing as much in terms of the meaningful, long-term sustainable social impact that can occur through their programs and initiatives. And those that, those few that are typically don't have a lot of metrics behind them. So, you know, it, this is, it, it is complicated. It can be complicated anyways, but it, that, that shouldn't be discouraging people from doing the work and hopefully we can have a long-term orientation, a, a long enough term orientation where we can look beyond quarterly earnings reports and look towards what can this actually mean for our employees, for our shareholders, but also for the, yes. the communities in which we live and work long-term. Yeah, and I think, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be, who was it, Johnny Carson's, was it Carmack, Carnac? Remember the, uh, like a clairvoyant that he tried to play, right? I mean, but if I, if I were, to try and predict um, what I think 
could happen is that, you know, these kids that are stuck at home and, and everybody else and all the other generations, I mean, we are going to swing out of this. They'll end up with a vaccine or something like that. We're going we're to swing out of this and we'll all be just fine, right? But I think there's been a wake up right now. We know that our, our atmosphere is cleaner right now. We know, I mean, there was already a lot of Me Too movements and laws in California saying there have to be two women on boards there now. I mean, this movement is here. And it's, it may be paralyzed a little bit for a couple of months, but I think it's going to pop out in full force in another year or so. And the companies that can step up to the plate and either show in their annual reports or I really, I don't like the branding part of it because I, I worry about the cost marketing, but if they can actually show, track it and say, yes, because we had women on, we have women on our boards, you know, we are concerned about pay, you know, a parity and stuff like that. We are concerned. We spent this time figuring out how we can lean out. People are getting back to their real values right now, which are really important to them. And it's going to show up in our workplace as well. There'll be an initial, I'm hungry, I'm starving, get business back. And then there'll still be this like, okay, we can't get hit like this again. <laughs> we got to be prepared. So yeah. those are the companies that are going to succeed who take it out of the social services headspace into I have to take care of us and be resilient. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Well, it has been a real pleasure talking with you and we haven't had nearly enough time um, to, to have this conversation. So perhaps we can um, continue this um, another time. I'd love to have you back on the yes, podcast. Yes, I would love to. Sure. I think we're kindred spirits on this and uh, agree, we're very yeah. passionate about it. So yes, I would very much love to. Well, good. Well, before we close, can you just take a minute and, and share with the listeners how they can get connected with you and learn more about um, your work? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I'm pretty easy to find. My website is Linda Lattimore. That's L-A-T-T-I-M-O-R-E dot com and throw all that in your show notes. And you know, I, I, I offer 30, 40 minute, just free consultation. There's, you can call me. I'm happy to, we can, you know, brainstorm a little bit about what might a social impact strategy be for you. And the other thing that I've been doing um, in the last month or so is my online class Illuminate, which helps people figure out kind of how they can show up in their resumes, like I mentioned before, and you know, what they bring with their life experiences, not their, not their job skills and stuff. Um, I'm, I've been offering uh, any of the podcasts I'm on, like a 40% discount to that class. It's super reasonable. It's only $149 anyway, and it's a big six-step program, but it's online. It's self-paced. And if anyone really wants that help in figuring out the kind of work they'd like to find, what should be in their resumes, how this is going to help them as we move forward, I'll send you that code. And if you want to put it in your show notes um, or something on the podcast, I'd be happy for anyone to, to come in and see if that helps them as they're moving forward. Awesome. That's wonderful. And that's really generous of you. Uh, I'd encourage everyone to reach out and get connected and um, take advantage of of your expertise and all the many, uh, all the great work that you're doing. Thank Thanks you. again. Thanks again for joining the, the podcast today. And I hope you have a wonderful Thank day. Thank you. I will. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.